Hello lovely people, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're here at NRG Studios. We're going to go and talk to Carl McCauley. Carl is one of the assistant engineers here and the last time I worked here a few weeks ago he was my assistant for a week while I was here doing uh, five seconds of summer. That was a lot of fun, Carl's really great so he's going to show us around the studio, we're going to check out all the gear, check out the rooms, get a little bit of history and as you probably know Jay um, Boomgardner is the owner of the studio and they very kindly let us come by and check it out. Um, what I like about the studio is the rooms all sound great. There's three main rooms, A, B, and C. A is, a, a is the original one, the tracking room. B was one he built later, and then C is a mix room. And those uh, three rooms all have unique things about them. Um, but what I do, as I say, what I really love about the studio is there's tons and tons of gear. Not just outboard and stuff, but they have a great collection of guitars and amps, basses, drums, pedals, everything. It's just a great place to come and make music and have things on your fingertips. So let's check it out. Okay, so I'm with Kyle McCauley. How are you, my Hello. friend? Good. How are you, sir? I'm good. We had a we had a week in here, what, about a month ago? Yeah, somewhere around there. It was fun. A month or two, yeah. Yeah. And so I got to have some fun with this console. I was engineering the project. We had, uh, um, oh my god, how do you pronounce his name? Hot, Paul, Paul's a second. Salam Remy. Salam Remy. Salam, Remy. Okay. Yes. Thank you, I don't want to mess up. So I was engineering, Salam Remy was the producer. So it was a lot of fun, and we had, we let us say who the band was? Well, it was five seconds of summer, I think I actually talked about it in one post. And they wanted to work live. Mm -hmm. So we really kind of, it was fun, because yeah. it was like a real tracking session. Right. Go figure. Which you they know? said they'd never done before. Yeah, isn't so that crazy? Kinda, yeah. Well, so we set up a drum the 2000s. kit. <laughs> And where was the preferred room? We'll go outside and check. Where was the preferred place again? It was basically uh, over the right. The back, right, yeah. Kind of facing out this way. Right. That's where 98% of the drums get recorded. Yeah. So what I did is, like, and Carl, Carl will attest to this, is I went in this room. I'd never been in recording drums in this room. And I just said, where do most people that are mm -hmm. good record? And right. you went over there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I remember as an assistant, and you probably experienced this, I remember as an assistant, people would come into me in my own studio and tell me where the best place to record drums in. And I'd had like, you know, Joe Ciccarelli recording drums in there, so I knew where the best place was, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I learned from that experience to always ask the assistant, because, right. I mean, how many, how many people have come through here? Oh, I mean, I've worked with hundreds of people here. Right. And you and a few other people have asked me before, like, you know, where do the drums go? Where, would, where should I put this? Mm -hmm. And they're like, do these rooms sound okay? Right. Is this what it's supposed to sound like in here? And you're like, yeah. Or some people kind of put the mics down to the ground or something, and right. you know, and they're like, oh, okay, well, let's try that. Let's try that. Yeah. Yeah. It's but, like. I mean, I've worked on hundreds of sessions in here in the past th three years. Exactly. So and you're it's a lot like, smarter I've heard than the good me and the bad, you know? Right. Yeah. So I, it's always great when you're engineering in a room you don't know, ask the assistant. Mm -hmm. And you engineered in here yourself as well. Yeah. Mad records in here yeah. as well. Yeah. That's the great thing about the classic classic old school and you know assistant is that you can engineer at any second mm -hmm. you can take over a session so tell us first of all because I'm sure everybody's wondering about this console um, this is a Neve 8068 and it sounds impeccable now I'm assuming it's two it Neve is two yeah 8068 stuck together yeah both of the consoles here are just Frankensteins in there that's two um, yeah two wedged together Yep. And the cool thing about it is like the directs, the directs and the auxes on this side and that side can be used independently because it's two different consoles or there's a patched point for some. Nice. So you can use, you know, aux one here to send to a reverb and then you can use aux one on that side to send to a parallel compression or if you pull the summed aux, mm -hmm. you can, they'll both feed the same spot, which is cool. Um, nice. Doesn't get used that often, but it's no, a cool. It's a cool thing to pull you out if you're in like a a tricky situation where you need some weird routing. You know, absolutely. I didn't. We didn't need to go quite that crazy. No, no. But it, it was definitely interesting because this was uh, this was the first time I'd ever come straight off the console and directs, and then just come back on the stereo bus. Normally, yeah. I'd come back individually out. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, but it was a quick and easy way of working. Yeah. So I was summing inside of Pro Tools. Yeah. Um, Which a lot of people work that way now. I know, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Well, I totally understand why. I totally, you know, it makes perfect sense. You can, because then you can take your Pro Tools session anywhere in the world. Well, that's what, that's what, I, that's what I like about it. Because yeah. if you spread it out and, you know, there's some people that spread it out and I mean, that's cool and it's fun and everything, mm -hmm. but then they're, 
added compression and EQ and everything to the monitor side. And then yeah. when the client takes it home and opens it up, they're going to be like, what, what happened to right. them, what we were listening to? Yeah, definitely. It's a different, a different day and age. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have to be able to, especially for a lot of sessions, you're probably getting a lot of sessions, correct me if I'm wrong, they're coming in and doing tracking day or days mm -hmm. and then go away and finishing up albums yeah. in their home studios. We get a lot of drums. Right. Or if people have like really crazy guitar setups and they want to use, you know, eight different amps or something like that. Right. They'll that come in sense. here. But a lot of, you know, two or three day drums. Right. And then they take the rest home and do guitars and vocals at their home studio. Which makes sense. Yeah. Because um, you can't fake that. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't fake that. And there's, some, and there's also something, I think one of the things that, um, when I come to rooms like NRG or uh, Sunset or United, those sort of famous rooms in LA, the other thing is, is that you, it's also inspiring as a musician. Mm -hmm. You come in here, you're a drummer, you're a bass player, you're a guitar player, and you're listening and you're, you're here in the room and you're remembering all those records that you grew up listening to recorded right. in these rooms. Right. Especially now, if you're like 20, 25 year old kid, mm -hmm. you're going to probably have, right. you know who Evanescence are, you know. You grew up on, on a lot the of records these, on the walls. Records on the walls. So, yeah. so they sort of inspire. And I think that's something that is very, very important that probably gets ignored in sort mm -hmm. of gear rundowns and tech talk mm -hmm. is that musicians, yeah, we can record anything in any situation. And that is wonderful. And I love to encourage people to record at any level. But the reason why people do come here even just to track drums for a couple of days is that they want right. that inspiration they right. want to it's the same thing as picking up like a 59 telly you can just feel everybody who's played it before you right you know what i mean it just yeah. stuff just comes out of it yeah even which if, is like here even if it's know? even if it's purely um uh what's the word uh, uh, uh hypothetical or um, uh, um psychosomatic right that's the word i'm looking for even if it's just psychosomatic and you know that there's you know, it's just that because we all like to be inspired. And sometimes it can be just a microphone mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a room and right. all in between. So this is a beautiful, beautiful console. Um, yeah, we had a great time on this. Um, we'll go into the live room in a second. Let's check out some of the outboard. You don't have a huge amount, but you have, you have the sort of just the stuff yeah. you need to get by. A lot of, we have a, a lot of stuff floating, but we kind of right. just put a pair of what most people want. Most people want in here, and then we got uh, you know LA two A's and LA three A's and I don't, I don't other we, stuff that's floating that we pull into where we need it to go. I don't think we needed to bring much else in. Um, Maybe we brought one or two more compressors. I can't remember because we were recording a whole live band. Yeah, I think we brought in one or two things. Yeah, but everything that I like, all, my, all the flavors here. You know, we've got DBX one sixties, two pairs of, so that's fantastic. A pair of distressors. Uh, of course, a pair of 1176s up here. Um, I suppose for printing mixes, you've got a, a, a SSL 4000 bus compressor there. Um, oh, did we end up using these 902s? What did we do on? Like an acoustic guitar, wasn't it? it was oh, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really kind of cool and fun. We sort of experimented with it. Um, the, the thing is with, with acoustic guitars, and I talk about this quite a lot, and I'm sure you experience this, is sometimes they get that sitar -y kind of effect. Mm -hmm. And... DSing them can get rid of some of that. Bzz, bzz, mm -hmm. bzz, bzz. Mm -hmm. So we put that on acoustic guitar. And it was really nice. It really tucked in uh, the the acoustic beautifully. But um, yeah, great stuff. And then we got 160 XTs, which I actually we use on it. I use on an inside kick. In fact, half the people I know use them on inside kicks. They sound amazing. Four of those. A GML. Yeah. Um, can't beat that. <laughs> can't beat that. Probably great on bass compression. Then of course, uh, sorry, bus, uh, great on the bus for EQ, sorry. Um, and then of course, a pair of Poltex and the obligatory H3000. Mm -hmm. um, what is that, is that a DAT player over there? Uh, it's just a CD player. Oh, CD player. It's broken though. We use it for the eighth inch. I know somebody asked me the other day to burn a CD and I realized I'd run out and we had run out weeks and maybe yeah. even months ago. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy how yep. fast it's moving? Yep. I, um, still, I still use CDs because my car doesn't have an aux input, but. That's, right. that's just me being me. Right. <laughs> They're um, obsolete. What are the main monitors in here? Dyn Audios? Dyn Audios. Um, oh, you're gonna have, I think it's the M4s or C4s. Yeah, they sound good in this C4s, room. C4s, yeah. I remember they, they weren't what I anticipated from a huge monitor. They didn't have a massive, massive low end. There is an M4, yeah, Dyn Audio M4. There's not a whole lot of low end. Yeah. That's, that's one thing about this room, but it's, it's, it is really flat. Yeah. And what you're hearing is is actually what you're getting. 
Yep. As opposed to like a super scooped main sound. Yeah, I mean, sounds it was good in the room and then sure. sounds terrible everywhere else. And I remember we had another pair of Dyn audios and we had some Genelex mm -hmm. here, so we covered all the bases. Yeah, we got um, NS10s, 1031s, and beautiful BM6s. Let's, uh, let's go check out the live room. Sure. So now we're in the uh, live room. Even with his little lapel mics, I'm assuming you can hear mm -hmm. live. Now we've got baffling here. When we did vocals, we uh, built a little vocal booth. Well, we didn't. Kyle did. <laughs> so, so I like to take responsibility for that. Carl Bill vocal booth, just cool. And it has glass, which is useful um, if you're putting it around musicians and stuff mm. so they can see each other. Right. But obviously we dampen that out for the vocals yeah. we put. We don't want those kind of reflections. But it's a, yeah, it's a fantastic live room. Mm. Drums we put over here. Yep. Per Kyle's recommendation. That way, facing this way is yeah. the spot. Yeah, it's really fantastic. It's a it's a big room, but it sounds bigger than it is. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you definitely gives you that like modern rock sound. Yeah. You know. So it's where Lincoln Park did their first record and. We did, we did the first one in here. Yeah, they did Hybrid Theory and Meteora. Oh, nice. Yeah, they did yeah. both of them here. They were here for a long time, weren't they? Oh yeah, that was long before my time, but right. they were. I think they were booking the studio for like a year at a time or something like right. that. Yeah. Hey, if you can, why not? <laughs> yes. And then you've got uh, a whole bunch of overdub yeah. rooms. I think we, we put guitars in here, didn't we? On that side, yeah. Yeah, normally guitars in here. Yeah. If, we're, if we're running things, um, if we're running things live. Um, guitars in here. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. And then... Yeah. Bass will normally go in here. I mean, this is you can you can flip flop that. There's no there's no rhyme or reason my bass would be in here and guitar in there or whatever. It's right. But yeah. So yeah, we did have bass in here, yeah. and then is it was this a C7? Yep. Yep. I yep. The Omaha C7. Try to remember. I just normally like to put bass in here because it's just normally one cab. Yeah. And then you can mic the piano too, you know, for overdubs. Right. As opposed to guitars where you might use six amps in there. Right. That makes sense. So there's just space. Yeah. And obviously everything's tie lined. We've yep. got 24 inputs in here, so that's nice. Yep. And the cues, Speaker, speaker selectors and speaker, uh, a speaker, speaker tie lines. Speaker tie lines in each room. A video tie line. Yeah, well, never use that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you could if you needed to. So it looks like uh, we're about to set up for a guitar session here. Yep. And uh, I'm assuming out here they're going to be micing the room and everything? Probably. I would, have, I would assume so. Two Marshall cabs. 414 and a 57. Nice combination. Sean, are you guys using room mics? Maybe. <laughs> the producer. Huh? <laughs> Up to the producer. Oh, not as of yet. <laughs> this is his very specific setup. Okay. He's very particular. <laughs> is that a Roy is that a black Roya? Yeah. None of our none of our Royers are the right colors. Both of our 121s are black. Our um, uh, SF24 is gold. Ooh, gold, very, it's very fancy. posh. Yeah. It's very posh indeed. <laughs> All right, lovely. Now, monitoring. Let's check out the monitoring. You've got private cues? Yep, my tech system. Um, people always ask why it says do not hot plug. It's because um, our tech, Wade Norton, modified them on the back, so there's an on and off switch, which, oh, is, which is not stock. Um, normally, you would have to turn the brain off yeah. and then unplug them all. Right. And then, or set them up, plug them all in, and then turn the brain on, and sure. then they would all power up. But this, because you're not supposed to unplug the Elkos when you're moving them, because you can short the pins and blow fuses in the main thing. Ah, so he modified them so you can turn them off on the box, unplug oh, it, and then move it. That's small. Yeah. And then, uh, so we have a mic panel here, got 48 ins, two sets of cues, tie lines, great. Yep, so he's just using the speaker tie lines right now to go to the cabs and Great. probably put the heads in the control room. Now, while, while we're talking about this, and we should walk over there, if uh, Eric comes around the back here, he'll notice that this stuff actually belongs to the studio. Yep. So, which isn't actually that typical. It is typical and more home orientated or, or producer driven ones, but what's great about NRG is that you have a huge amount of amps as well. Yep, and guitars. In, and in stock, and guitars. 68 Ludwig drum kit. and That's great. Or a 60s 
Ludwig kit. I think a right. couple of the Toms aren't quite 68, but... Hey, that's okay. <laughs> and all the cabs are labeled on the back with what speakers they are and what ohmage, so it's easy to find if you wanted green bags or if you wanted V30s or, nice or any shit. of that fun stuff. There's a green bag. So most, of them are, most of them are green bags, but we have some vintage 30s. Great. All right, well, let us head over. So we're in Studio B. Mm-hmm. This is a freaking cool room. This, yeah. is, this is like, I was just saying to Eric, I was like, if you had a studio and you could have any studio of your own studio, yep. it'd probably look like this. Yep. It's like this room, and then I think the village has a similar kind of, what do they call that one? Like the Turkish room, or the Moroccan room. They call this one the Moroccan room. I call it, oh, okay. This, this is the Moroccan room. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. There's just something really, really inviting and warm. Plus, yep. it's got this beautiful, mm -hmm. like, totally Frankenstein old Neve. Yep. Just really, really cool. So, Carl, yep. it's morning here. You see, this is mm -hmm. we we always film before we start sessions. Yep. So, um, you know, because I do actually make a living as a producer and an engineer. Right. <laughs> strangely enough, um, so we're always doing this in the morning before we do any work. Now, how long have you been here now? Three years. Uh, three years, yeah. But you came from another studio, didn't you? I worked at Westlake for two years before I came here. What am I talking about? I'm talking about freaking uh, like you know. Um, What's his face? His room. Um, God, it's blanking on me. It's the one further west, the studio further west. It's the village. The village. Yeah, thank yeah. You. yeah. They have a room. Yeah. That's like, they call something like the Moroccan or whatever. Anyway, edit all that schnizzle out. <laughs> I don't want to look like a complete idiot. Only a partial idiot. <laughs> yeah, right. So you start off at Westlake. Mm -hmm. um, what was your journey? Um, I went from runner to uh, intern to runner to how, but how did you get to even get to that studio did you go to music school did you oh yeah i um i went to the conservatory of recording arts and sciences in phoenix um which was which was fun um before that i was playing in a band and we recorded our first record and while we were recording the record i was like yeah i want to do what that guy's doing <laughs> i was more nice. jealous of the engineer recording it than i was of actually being there to record that's cool. So then after that, I bought a 002 and a 414 and started recording things and then realized I didn't know very much, so I went to school. And where, where are you from originally? Uh, Florida. Florida. Mm -hmm. So saved up some money, went to the school. Did you get a, a, a grant? How did you do it? Um, remember when BP spilled a bunch of oil into the Gulf of Mexico? I do. I remember yeah. that happening, yeah. A lot of people lost um, uh, wages from like lack of tourism and stuff that year. Right. So BP covered a bunch of people, and I took that money and went to school. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. So were you wor were you working? Did you have a job? I did. Yeah. What I was working did? at the Hard Rock Cafe in this place called T1 of Flats. It was like a Tex-Mex place that a bunch of punks worked at. <laughs> and you have a punk rock band. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, I like that. I mean, I I, I, like, I like knowing the background story because um, we were talking about this just before we, the, we started rolling earlier this morning. And uh, I like the stories to know and understand how people got there because mm. most of the time we want to believe it's, you know, magic. Right. But we're all just a bunch of dudes doing this. Yeah. You it know. was just like, hey, that looks fun. Oh, this is fun. I'm not very good at this. I want to get better at this. So let's go to school for it. Great. And then as soon as you leave school and as soon as I got to Westlake, I was like, uh, I don't know anything anymore. You know, you leave school and you're like, oh, yeah, I got this down pat. Then you go to a real studio and you're like, no. What, um, was, the bi what was the biggest differentiator for you, like getting to that um, studio? Uh, the confidence and the, like, uh, just the demeanor that people had that were working at the studio. Like, the assistants and stuff when I was interning, it was like, like I could plug in a microphone and do those things, but they were just like it was just like you knew that they knew what they were doing and you just that confidence takes years to build or it's like yeah there was just this aura about them that you're just like oh you walk in the room you i don't feel comfortable in here but then they are just completely controlling it that's great which from an engineer or producer's standpoint is you just want to feel comfortable when you walk into a room that if you say can you this isn't working that mm -hmm. you're going to figure it out right i i think of that um I don't remember the name of the book. I think it's the Conrad Hilton book. And I think there's a, that oh. is the perfect example of what an assistant engineer should be. Because he talks about like when the bellhop 
the guy or the girl comes out of their hotel room and goes, ah, my sink isn't working. I can't, there's no water in my, in my mm. bathroom. That bellhop obviously runs down, talks to the concierge, what all goes straight to the, whatever, goes to a maintenance man. But then it's the bellhop's job to come back an hour later, knock on the door and say, oh, did that get fixed okay? You happy? Right. It's that follow through. And I think that that's like the ultimate gig for, a, for an assistant engineer, mm -hmm. is if I ask you something, you can't respond with, um, oh, I asked, oh, I didn't, did they not get it figured out? You know, right. you need to know. Right. You need to know whether it's food order or plugging in a C12 or whatever it might be. Or, right. Or, or asking you, can you or can you rent something for me? Right. Because maybe there's a piece of equipment we need, and you have to rent it from a third party. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't need to be on the phone with the rental company. You're dealing with that, and even if you're not directly dealing with it, you're the only person I talk to. Right. And that's a big deal for an assistant, isn't it? You everything comes through you. You are the studio. Mm -hmm. You're talking to the studio manager. You're talking to rental companies. You're talking to whatever you're doing. You're plugging in mics. You're right. getting other people to help you. But my point of call as the engineer, in particular, is just you. Right. I don't need to know these other 50 people. Well, that's the that's a, it, working at a studio like this. It's the one thing that we try to instill into people coming up through the chain because they'll come back and they'll be, uh, uh, this is just an example, they'll be like Parmesan cheese on the fries when the person asks for no Parmesan cheese mm -hmm. on the fries. And the runner brings it back and you're like, dude, like, did you not check it? Right. You know, friendly, you know, yelling at him or anything, but yeah. it's like, dude, like, you got to get that right because, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. Well, it is because when you start assisting, not only do you have to make sure that all of that stuff's right, yep. but you have to make sure that everybody has everything they need, everything's working. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes three microphones go down in the course of 30 seconds and somebody's trying to place food and management needs to talk to you, you know, and you're just yep. all over the place and you got to keep it all together, yep. which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it's like... I. I'm glad we're talking about it because, in a way, I think it's a it's a it's a great illustration of the responsibility of an, an assistant. I don't think that gets talked about enough. And but what I what what I feel like is is almost like you're the you are because you're the first point of call for everybody and everything goes through you. You become like the the studio that you're working in's manager. Everything you're like managing the whole thing. Yeah. Everything. Everybody looks to you because well, yes, you have to come in. And that's the reason why a lot of clients will come back and. Right. specifically request the person they had last time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, the assistant who was here before me, who w is now in school, um, uh, he had been here years longer than I have, you know, but there were sessions where people would come in and they would, re and then they, when they would come back in, they would request me. Not because I was better, he was leagues better than I was, but just right. because when he came in, when they came in, I made them feel comfortable and, you know, because you're the center guy. And the, yep. the same thing would happen on the flip side, you know, people would come in and then they would request him every time they came sure. in just because he knew their setup and, you know, and then when engineers come through, like, we have all the setup sheets in our emails and stuff. Um, so you're able to, hey, last time you were in, you used all of this stuff. Do you want to do, you wanna do oh, that again? You know, and you're like, so much oh, what did I use last time? Oh, this is what you did last time. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know? No, it's great. It's great to to go to a studio maybe with a ten or eleven a.m. downbeat, and you come in and you've been there before. All the drums are set up, mm. all the same miking. Literally, you come in and the setup is the same. Like the gain staging, your EQs and everything on your console, the compression's all in the same way. And you come in and you go, "Sounds pretty close. I want to change this, this, mm. and this." That's so much better than having to start again from scratch. Yeah. I mean, you know that probably from people you've talked to working in Nashville. I mean, I hear that they do three hour blocks and they're no. doing like four of those a day. So they'll have rooms where they come in and, and the guys are paying for three hours and they want to come in and they want to track drums right. you know, immediately. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, but I, I, I get it, that. you know, you're, you're moving fast, you've got lots of work to yeah, do. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, these aren't necessarily unbelievably expensive rooms, but Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, that it's a lot of money. You're talking right. over a thousand dollars a day for a decent room in this town, between mm -hmm. one to two thousand dollars, depending on, on which room you're in. But if it's run efficiently, you can get a lot of work done. Oh yeah, a lot of work mm -hmm. done. A lot more than struggling and spending half the day plugging all your mics into you, right. you know, and then yeah, you might get three days to get the drum sound, but you come in here and 
15 minutes. Yeah, drum set would be <laughs> yeah. very, very quick. Well, I love that sort of, that, that area. So, um, what records have you worked on? I'm sure people are thinking that in the back of their mind. What have you done? Um, let's see, I assisted the last and final Motorhead. In with this, Cameron. In yeah. this room with Cameron Webb, yeah. We actually have a course with the, one of those songs, Electricity. Oh, yeah? Out, oh, yeah. assisted on, yeah. Yep, I was in this room when Lemmy was sitting right there writing that song. Um, uh, Lamb of God. Great. Uh, Esperanza Spalding. Oh, wow. Uh, her, really talented. Her, her last Emily's De Evolution record. Yeah. Was that in this room or in A? Uh, it was in this room. Uh, she cut the uh, rhythm tracks all live. She had like an audience in here of like record execs and everything, and it was like kind of a live show. And she wow. was cut, yeah. I mean, just, she's like one of those people that you just you see and you're just like, oh, I hate you, but I love you so much. You're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm never gonna pick up a bass guitar after seeing you because it's pointless, right? Um, no, not it's not pointless, but you know what I mean. I understand. And then she did her vocals and a couple guitar overdubs in Studio A, um, Smashing Pumpkins were in here. That's it's a lot the, of great records. That's the highlights, I guess. Now, you obviously are here to assist engineers and producers, mm -hmm. um, but you must, you know, you're imparting and helping them like you helped me when I first came mm -hmm. here, you know, pointing out the best places in the room. But I imagine you also learn a huge amount from them. Yeah. What uh, do you feel like is the stuff that you've really learned the most? Um, ooh. Huge question. Yeah. Um, I would say it's more about the the attitude and how to kind of manage things than it is anything really technical. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times nowadays, nobody really has that much time to do anything crazy. You know, they're coming in and they need to get 12 drum songs done in two to three minutes. You know, the drums are pretty, you know, I could probably guess what the next engineer's drum setup is going to be. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, every once in a while, um, somebody will do something crazy, like put, a you know, one of those surface mounts. What are the, we have the Shure A19, the the old like kind of like the Beta 91, on the ground, and then he turned the the pre all the way up, all the way up, and then used the fader to set his volume, and it just got this super crunchy, super distorted sound. You know, so stuff like that I pick up, but most of the time it's just how to deal with the clients and how to talk to people. And cause a lot of people are doing the producing engineer thing um, at the same time. Absolutely. You know, like Zeus or Josh Wilbur or Cameron Webb, you know, they're all engineering and producing at the same time. Um, so just being able to see how to deal with people and like, oh, you have somebody like Lemmy who's not getting this part right. How do you tell them that, you know, because mm -hmm. that's more important than what mics you're going to put up. Yeah, I can. I mean, Cameron was their longest serving producer engineer. I think he had six did a lot of them. albums, yeah. I think, and a live album as well. So it was like 2000, 2001, right up until, you know, a year mm -hmm. ago when Lemmy died. So yeah, the longest running guy. From what I could tell, you were in the sessions. What I can tell what Cameron said and said on camera is like they, they were able to like push and pull and they had a oh, yeah. good honest relationship they went into it probably more than i've seen anybody else go into it good um but there was a mutual respect exactly like yeah. lemmy would literally tell cameron he was an idiot mm -hmm. but then two minutes later they were doing what cameron said they should yeah. do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> yeah that's a great place to be at because that's what you want in any kind of relation, working mm -hmm. relationship. You want to be able to ability to go, no, that sucks. Right. You go, ah, oh, you're wrong, and then you hear it and go, oh, okay, whatever, you're yeah. right. Like I'll never say something sucks. If somebody's right. like, hey, let's put a tambourine here, you're like, ah, let's try it. Metaphorically sucks. Yeah, I, I won't say it sucks until after we try it. Right. And if you try it, you're like, okay, that sucks. Let's let's mute <laughs> that. But you can't say it sucks if you never try it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. No. I. I. Def I, I completely got that um that from cameron that they had that kind of relationship where they could mm -hmm. like push and pull backwards yeah. and forwards yeah i i mean I, I love cameron's whole demeanor though is there's no ego so if no. he's telling you he likes or doesn't like something it's the agenda is i want this record to sound yeah. great not i want to be right right which we've all experienced mm -hmm. you know you you do get the get, get guys or girls or whatever that just want to be right in that situation mm -hmm. um 
but you know the only thing that's right is what sounds best for the song yeah that's all that matters now um just dumb question if you were tracking drums in this studio and you could choose any room which room do you prefer uh if you would have asked me six months ago i would have said studio a but currently studio b oh that's good yeah and it's funny because um the other assistant here patrick uh his answer would be the reverse Interesting. six months ago it would have been this one now it's a, a. Which it's, tells you they're pretty comfortable. <laughs> so you're probably you're probably getting to learn to love a room, and then you got so used to the sound, and you get excited by something new. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I I, I feel the same way. It's like the best drum sounds I've got have been in rooms that I haven't lived in for a long time. Right. <laughs> right. After a while, and then I go back and listen to something I did five years ago was something a room I was in and out for a whole year I'm like wow that sounds so amazing why why was I over that room mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> you know they say like familiarity like. breeds contempt yeah all right so well let us um let's check out this console yeah okay so this is uh this really is a Frankenstein oh I love the uh, yeah. I love the taped on Neve logo <laughs> which is actually yeah. probably never Oh, I used to know what session put that on there, but I can't remember. That's pretty funny. It yeah, was years and years and years ago. It looks like it says never, and then they cut the R off and yeah. Neve for a front of a magazine or something. Yeah, it definitely, oh, I wish I, <laughs> I can't remember. But the, yeah, because somebody came in the other day and they're like, oh, we put this on there like 10 years ago. And it's still there. It's very Salvador Dali. Yeah. Does anybody understand that reference? I'll see if there's any questions or comments below. All right, so, um, so you basically got, I mean, is it, dumb question, so was it originally an 8078 40 channel? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the 40 channel, yeah, it, it is an 8078. So it's an 8078 um, that's been modded. Which I believe it was originally built for a broadcast studio in Austria. I see. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure if we got it from that studio, but I believe it was a broadcast board built in Austria, or built for uh, Austria. Runs on 30 volts, interesting fact about it. Oh, that is crazy. So these meters, though, were these ever Neve? This is this is completely retrofitted. Oh yeah, yeah I don't uh, recognize any of that. Nobody really uses any of that. So we've got the. Uh, oh yeah, these are three one oh ninety ones. Yeah, they're great. Although most people just use the ten seventy threes to track on. Of then, course. And then monitor over here, but every once in a while, when you want more. Um, more EQ options, people will track with this side. But this is essentially like the, you track drums, etc. from yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, the, both of our rooms are 24 in, 48 out, which I'm sure we'll get some slack for, but it is what it is. Right. And uh, yeah, so most of the time it's just all 24, 10, 73s. Great. And then returning over there. Perfect. And then you got a pair of Poltex mm -hmm. here. What is this underneath here? Um, ITI, I don't even know yeah. that. To be honest, I've I've never used it. Nobody's ever used it. It looks like a GML snob style. It's it, obviously not a GML. But yeah. I think it kind of has that flavor. I'd like to try it just because um, it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why nobody's... I mean, if you're tracking in here, you're going to need that kind of finite uh, control. Really this is great. The Avalon? Oh, yeah. It's an AD2055. Yeah, I I like it with the top end. I, I stole that from Eric Madrid. So what do you do? Top end boost? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit on the vocals. It's right. just super sweet. And what are you what are you selecting? Oh, what is fifteen. Fifteen? Yeah. The shelf. And I'll just do that on the way in. Like Beautiful. A, a sixty seven, eleven seventy six and just, just nice. a little bit on the very top just to open it up a little bit. It sounds fantastic. Gorgeous. As you said before, these are all 1073s, mm -hmm. classic EQs and pre's, of course. Um, are these actually hooked up to flying faders, the whole console? They are, yeah. Oh, great. Yep. And then you can. there's a button in the center section called Join Desk, and you press that. And then now um, the, the buses right here, one and two, will go to the stereo bus as well. Oh, I see. So now you can, uh, like if you're mixing, now you have all of the... All of these will go to the two bus. Now, when Jay's mixing, does he mix in here or the SSL? He mixes in the SSL. In the SSL, right. Yeah, not many people mix in here. Could be kind of cool to mix in here. I, I, 
people have done it. It's just, it's a process, right? You know, it's yeah. not, it's not nearly as quick as mixing on an SSL. I'm talking just strictly like documentation and time wise and stuff. Oh yeah, I imagine um, recalls would be a pain. Yeah, and then now that everybody's so used to in the box, mixing on a Neve is three, four times as long as mixing on an SSL. Right. I suppose the only thing you could do is just use it for the for just for the line amps coming in, mm. just to give you a bit of weight mm -hmm. to your signal. You know, all those extra transformers can really add some weight to it. Obviously. No, definitely. Um, definitely. Beautiful. Um, okay, we got a lot. I, I, I love when it did. Jay actually have this built? Did he put it together, or was this when you say you bought it from Broadcast Place? Do you know the history of it? Um, I don't know the exact history of it. No. All right, so down here we've got some extra compression. Beautiful. Yep, it's fantastic. Yeah, these are three two two six fours. Um, the five threes here for limiting. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on. And then do you bring in, well, you don't really need to because look, you've got two 1176s, yeah. four 160s again, cut pair of distresses the 160s. Kind of the same thing as yeah. Studio A, you know? Well, that's smart. Yeah, it, it just means you can move from one room to another easily. Yeah, it just covers all the bases and then, you know. For tracking is easy enough yeah. compression. We got like a gate stay level and a Collins compressor mm -hmm. and a varying mu and floating 33609 and all, all all the other standards that we can pull into the rooms but most right. of the time this is more than enough to just get people tracking and this is a beautiful looking room to, and with these crazy looking dyn audios yeah dyn audio <laughs> c4s jay absolutely loves them they sound great well, let's go and track out this uh, beautiful live room oh nice heavy door mm -hmm. for a weak english guy like me <laughs> There's a nice little loungy bit here. This is, uh, you know, if you just want to take it easy, yeah. you know, put some headphones on. <laughs> so I'm guessing people mic this up sometimes with the door cracked. What do you mean? Oh, mic in here? Yeah. No, I've never seen anybody do that. Really? You know, like drum, drums in there and then put a mic in here? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, who did that? Oh, uh, Matt Squire would do that. Oh, nice. He would do them on the other side, though. He'd do them on the other side. He'd put like a, a stereo pair like that against the wall. Nice. I think he, I think he would do it on the other side. Uh, okay, cool. I know in Blackbird Studio D, I think it is, is that's the trick, is a little room, but they also make that. See, this, this is the secret here. If you look right up, big drums isn't always about big rooms, it's about high ceilings. They had this. Metallica room at uh, the plant where they did a bunch of Metallica records. I think we talked about it before when I first came in. It was, was, was a room this kind of size, um, but it had the high ceiling. And that, I don't know if you can hear it through our little tiny lapel mics here, but it's huge! Nice. Yeah. So where do you put the kit? Uh, I put the kit right under that light right there. Yeah. The throne, like right here. Facing out that way. It's interesting because it's, it's big, but it's not overly bright. Yeah. So it means that you're not gonna, some of the bigger rooms I've been in or bigger sounding rooms, one of the issues is, and I'm sure you know where I'm going, is that it, all, it just makes cymbals go psh, 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 mm. which eventually ruins your chance of using your room mics mm. because you, you wanna hear and what you really hear is psh, 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 psh. Right, yeah, yeah. So I like how, what? I know how dark it is, but it's not all psh, 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 psh. Awesome. Really beautiful room, and it looks really cool as well yeah. as, as well as being a great sounding room. So a big sound, but a smaller square footage than the other one. Yeah, they're 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 pretty close to the same size. I think the ISO booths kind of help in here, but um, but yeah. And then you've got so this is the ISO booth over here. Yep. <coughs> we walked through one of them, but then this is one that's pretty much a mirror, slightly bigger. I love how, I mean, I'm assuming people have done what I'm about to say many times, and that's put a small drum kit in here mm -hmm. and then mic out there. Mm -hmm. Because, like, what? You're not going to hear it from my lapel, unfortunately. But you hear this all, what? What? Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I've set up drums in here and then put like three stereo sets of mics in the, right. in the live room. Fantastic. So you get really nice, tight, close miking mm -hmm. if you want it. 
and then massive drum sounds that we'll uh, relate to in there. My only problem with that is you just, when you do that, you kind of lose the stereo image of the room mics. I agree, yeah. You know. Yeah, I like stereo imagery. I'm, I'm a big uh, measure from the snare. Mm -hmm. You probably just did it with me, and you say up, and I love the floors. Mm -hmm. And these probably sound great to Mike as well. Oh, yeah. Probably like get a, a little bit more an snap. M an M49. Beautiful, yeah. So speaking of which, is there a mic locker we can look at? Oh, uh, sure. Let's check out the mic locker. So we've got a guitar closet here. Yep. Oh, very nice. Um, that's one of the cool things about NRG is we have um, a lot of instruments. Yep. And uh, there's a couple missing right now. All the, all the fenders are missing, actually. Um, we have a, oh no, well, there's the 59P bass. Are they in? Maybe they're, 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 they're in, in studio there because they're, yeah. they're tracking guitars today, yeah. Um, but we got a 59P bass, we got a 59 Strat, a 59 um, Telecaster. Let's look at the 59P bass. The 59P bass is right here. We've got a lot of bass players to watch. So, good old coffin case. Yeah, I remember the coffin cases. It's a Dracula 59P bass. Oh, gorgeous. There we go, yeah. Wait, did we have that out for that session? Yep, yep. We had it out. Great. It's definitely, definitely got some character. <laughs> yeah, do you want to find it? No, no, go for it. Oh, it's so light. Yeah, it's a dream to play. <laughs> Definitely been some detuning going on. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'll take two. It Thank feels you. great. Yeah, right. <laughs> Gorgeous. Yep. It's a. Uh, yeah, we got a Les Paul Jr. with P90s. Gold top. So you have a Yamaha baritone. Custom, baritone. Always, always good for rock. We got a Gibson J45 from the 50s. J45 is beautiful for tracking. Uh, yeah, Gibson Les Paul Black. What was the uh, Strat you were talking about? That's oh, in the other room. That's Strat's in A. Yeah. It's in A. This thing's great though. Please let's see. This is my favorite guitar we have. Okay, well that's what we want to see, his favorite guitar. Uh, I love the case, good condition. This guitar <laughs> is more than half of the guitars on my band's record. Oh, It's wow. just, it's hard to beat. Look at that guy. Oh, again, light. Yeah. Really chunky neck too. It's <laughs> great. Put that thing through a Marshall. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to beat. Yeah, it plays beautifully. Looks great. Neck's chunky, but great for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Listen to the sustain. Yeah. You hear the sustain? Well, you would if it was plugged in. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's fun to Sorry, play. I was getting a little self indulgent there. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It's kind of hard that? not to. Um, it's 50s. Um, I'm not sure the exact year. Early 50s, I believe. Gorgeous, simple looking uh, yeah. tool. I like that. They just Fixed bridge, volume tone. They got it right. One pickup, volume tone. Yeah. Plug it in an amp and go. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. <clears throat> Hosting Johnny Thunders. Yeah. Uh, then you've got a lot of alcohol hiding up there. <laughs> this is energy. Hollywood vodka. Uh, <laughs> well, not go that far, but yeah. 
That doesn't represent the personality of the employees. <laughs> Not the Hollywood vodka? No. The, the sky vodka maybe? The tequila or the whiskey behind there is a little bit more ah. of a representation of us. <laughs> so you got some fun outboard stuff in here. Yep. Floating pair yep. of newer 1073s. Uh, I think they're I think they're vintage. They're just if, in mint if condition. If I'm not mistaken. Um, they must be in mint condition and I'll just uh, I'll just take this home. They might have been redone at some point in time, but yeah. Lovely. We'll pull that into Studio C for the SSL every once in a while because great. Nobody likes SSL breeze. Um, okay. <laughs> but yeah. yeah uh, and then the API, API lunchbox, lunchbox over yeah. there. A couple of extra pre's, a couple mm -hmm. of EQs, some 550As. We've got around here. I don't know, what is an FS900? Oh, that's the uh, DBX rack with the um, uh, DS. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, the 900 rack. Sorry, brain wasn't wasn't fully engaged. I've seen the LA3A there. Yep, we got three of those, two vintage ones, and then a reissue. Nice. A uh, single reissue. Two LA2As. Um, gate stay level. Beautiful. Uh, culture vulture. Uh, Some compacts. Compacts. Yep. Oh, and a Cooper Time Cube. Yep. There's the there's the hose. Ah, the garden hose is in here. Yep, that's cool. It's really cool for like doubling guitars if you have like a single acoustic or like yeah. a single clean. Jay will do that a lot. And then either use the 14 or the 16 or mm -hmm. combine them. Um, Great. And then put it on the other side and it... Beautiful. I don't know what exactly it does, but it creates a double more so than sure. just adding a 14 millisecond. Right. Yeah, there's something very unique about it. I, I, yeah. When I was working with Dave Sardi, he used them all the time. He always, um, he liked to, he called it like the John Lennon vocal effect. Mm. It's, uh, you know, obviously that's a matter of taste, but yeah, it's, it's pretty, it is literally that. It's a huge yeah. garden hose with mm. a signal going on one end and recording mm -hmm. on the other. <laughs> Crazy. Um, lots of other that's stuff. That's those EMI comp. I have a culture vulture. Those um, are fun. Yeah, those are great. That's a junior Lang, um, which are uh, great. The great TQs. Mm -hmm. Purple 1176. PCM 42 for mixing. More 902 stuff. Some more Neves. I mean, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, there's yeah. a Lynx for a different... API 5500. Now you can bring the um, Lynx in. Can you put that into other rooms so you can get more inputs? Um, we just mainly use that for the tape machines. For tape machines, right. Yeah. Um, oh, some, V72s. Oh, nice, some V72s. Beautiful. Dimension D. Yeah, so we got we got a decent amount of gear. Um, the 120 sub harmonic thingy. Oh yeah. This thing over there. And a DAT player! Yeah. The Panasonic DAT player. No, it just hasn't been pulled out for probably 20 years, but yeah, there's 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 two rows of gears. Great. And just there's a Collins compressor. Beautiful. Yeah. Germanium, Chandler Limited. Oh, and great stuff. If anybody wanted to geek out on it, it's all online. There's the dragons, slate dragons, which are cool. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. Well, so and another SSL up here because Jay just bought another one for parts. So there's SSL parts everywhere. Oh, interesting. It was cheaper to do that than repair every channel on its own. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so where's the mic locker? Mic locker is right here. Let's check out the mics. Ah, oh, beautiful. Wow. So I guess we'll just start here. This is like the dynamic side. The dynamic ribbon side. Beautiful. Um, all your standards. Uh, vintage D12s, which are Lovely. cool. Um, uh, BK, BK, yeah, BK5, which is right. a, a ribbon, RCA. Um, we got two coals, 4038s. Gorgeous. Um, like 17 or 19 421s. Same amount of 57s. Can never have too many 57s in a recording studio. No, no, definitely not. A lot of great Those DIs. Are our DIs, yeah. Stereo pair of Demeters. We got a Ready. That's the um, Juice Box. Uh, that's the Evil Twin. It's backwards, but. Yeah. Um, People love that. We have three Avalons. One's actually right here, and it says broken. But two of them, and then the, the Little Labs PCP, which is great if, if you're running multiple guitar amps. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Be able to switch between them. Mm -hmm. Turn one on, turn one off, phase. Yep, those are great. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, so this is this A side. blue mouse. Yeah. I'm just intrigued to what a blue mouse looks like. I don't even know that. 
Oh, okay, I do know this one. Yeah, it's. I think they're they're de they're designed based around the FET forty seven, if I'm not mistaken. Looks like a, almost like a five sixty three CMV five sixty three. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. The lollipop mic. Beautiful. Yeah. And then we've got all our. So this is the the least exciting. Oh, and then up here is the um, Royer SF twenty four uh, V, the vacuum tube stereo one. Um, and then the Phantom Power One stereo mic next to it, the SF24. Great. And then there's a blue bottle in there, and then two 47s. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then we got another 47 over here. But that's just here. that stuff that's over there. <coughs> yeah, so C24, two C12s, um, and all of these are vintage, by the way. Yeah. 251. 251, vintage. Beautiful. Um, KM54, we normally have two, but one. You mean a vintage TLM 170? For, yeah, right. <laughs> um, but one's out for repair. I love KM54. Yeah, they're I fantastic. Yeah, these are just. Yeah, those are great. I actually labeled all these when I was an intern. <laughs> all the little bags. Beautiful. Yeah, my. Um, my. Did you, oh, so this. Where'd you get this from? Who makes this? This is what I need to do because oh. my, mine is broken. I'm not sure who makes that. Is yeah. that the original one that it came no, with? No, not the original. No. Mine's the original and it's falling apart. I don't think that's the original. It looks much newer. I'll ask, I'll ask Jay next time I see him. Yeah, let's find out. See where he goes. Yeah, that looks newer and yeah, a little bit more high tech than. I'll let you know. Yeah, because my, mine's like all taped up. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. With this beautiful mic all taped together. 254 here. Gorgeous. 84s, um, the Klaus Heim, uh, the Klaus Heim, uh, yeah, we got two M49s, two M49 Klaus Heinz mod, yep, um, the 269, which is like my favorite piano mic now. Isn't that doesn't Dave Way telling us the 269 is like a souped up 67? Yeah, it, uh, basically 67 with yeah. some component difference, right? I'm not that's, an expert, please leave comments and questions below. I uh, know I'm fairly certain that that's that's exactly what it is, like a broadcast 67 or something, but. I mean, they look exactly like a 67. Yeah. Um, I think there's minimal differences between the two, but, but I, I hear love people, these mics people on have piano, love like, oh my God, it's incredible. Yeah, and then we got three 67s, um, then two Klaus modded 67s. C3, um, you, uh, 47 FET. Three FET 47s. Um, here's the 67s. We got some Sheps, two two twos, which are nice tube um small diaphragms i know people love those as overheads oh yeah they're great on overheads mm. they're a favorite around here um and this is becoming some of our favorite snare mics with the employees the that's interesting that's what this. yeah you know that, which one i'm talking about yeah i do and um, um jack douglas likes that on snare yeah it's uh both me and the other assistant are uh are using it on snare all the time now which we stole from uh Elvis basket, so. He may have stolen it from Don't Jack. <laughs> <laughs> we did that yeah. on uh, Aerosmith Rebel. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's cool. I love it actually. And then some C thirty sevens, nice. Some C thirty sevens, yep. Um, yeah. Well, here's other chefs. Oh yeah, beautiful. Two one two one twenty ones. Oh, see, this is what I was saying about our one twenty ones. Like all of them are black. Huh? Maybe that was standard early on. Uh, I don't believe so. So I think they're just custom or whatever. Jay asked for them in black. Yeah. None more black. I don't know the purpose of it, but but it's cool. So here we have pedals and lots of them, mm -hmm. organized into categories. Yep. Distortion. Nice. I don't know what this is. We were looking at this earlier. It's, it says it's made in West Germany. Can you please anybody below? Questions, comments, let me know what this is. Oh, wait there. Kent, the Angry Fuzz, Germany. I think I, I pulled it out one time to use it, but it, it didn't work for what I was trying to do. Uh, I was trying uh, to do something weird. Yeah. But it sounded good. It just wasn't wasn't what I wanted. Angry Fuzz. But you got classic box tone bender. You yeah, know, beautiful. One of the holy grails of fuzz circuits. Very nice. Here's fuzz face, which is another holy grail of fuzz circuits. Roger Mayer. And then base Big Muff. We don't have a regular Big Muff, which we need to get, but I'll do the trick. <laughs> Very nice. There's an, NR, there's an um, 
an Ibanez one here. I like some of the weirder, cheaper Japanese yeah. ones from the 80s and stuff. Mm -hmm. This one's interesting because you, after you set the things, you can push the buttons in so it can't be knocked. Mm -hmm. Which is great for gigging because then you can trust that your settings won't be changed. You know, it's like when you're packing your pedals up mm -hmm. each time. Um, so it looks like a classic Sans amp. Uh, oh, it's a VT bass. VT bass. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Don't know that. Sans so, some of the pedals are random and it's kind of like, wh why do we have these? But yeah, that could be kind of cool though. So I think they just, we just acquired it. There's a Jimi Hendrix time. reissue Fuzz. Yep. Love that selective discography on the back for Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> All of it. That's Jimi Hendrix discography. Which one should I listen to? All of them. All of them, yes. <laughs> you don't I, need a selected discography, just listen to the whole thing. I went to the Peterson uh, Car Museum with my son over the weekend, um, and uh, oh, yeah. the kids that were working there were playing Hendrix. Oh, and, really? But they were playing Band of Gypsies, not like Are You Experienced Era, a little bit more pop. They were playing like Machine Gun. When you walk into the gift store, I'm like, this is cool. Yeah. This is cool. I like these. It's like these two Latino kids just like rocking out. That's awesome. I was like, First of all, it made me feel quite happy that a couple of 20-year-olds were listening mm. to Hendrix, and specifically uh, the album. Um, so I don't know what this is. Anybody know what this is? It says made exclusively for Grouch. This is kind of cool. So it's called a Harmon Booster. Yeah, what the... With the a broken the volume. volume knobs, but at least it's broken full up. Spent a little bit of time trying to find one, but we haven't been able to find one yet. It's called the Playboy. So again, if anybody knows the replacement part, let us know. Yeah, have. this is cool. <laughs> And a blood drive, which is actually, yeah. these are cool. Yep. Yeah, I like this. All right. Um, more distortions with some chorus. You got your classic. Love that. Boss chorus. I have ensemble. one myself. Very, this very good. This was the first chorus pedal? I don't ever? know. You might be right. I think I it's well, it, it, at least one of them. Um, this is a green rhino by Way Huge. Yeah, they make great. awesome pedals. They do. Absolutely I love them. I love them. Um, what is this? That is a Retro Mechanical Labs. From Portland, I believe. Yeah, I don't Retro, yeah, retro mechanical yeah. distortion box. Don't quote me on the Portland thing, but yeah, that guy's awesome. His all of his stuff looks like that. It's just like custom stuff. That's a really cool distortion box. It's a beautiful looking pen. Really cool. H two O. Mm-hmm. It's pretty standard, that guy. That looks great. Uh, See this. These are the kind of things I love. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to have my usual philosophical BS conversation everybody's going to criticize me for. And it's okay. It's just that th there's so many things that have become standard, like really cool pedals, that we now it's becoming too commonplace. So things like an Arion or an Aria made pedals as well, or an Ibanez. This is, I have one, one made by Aria, which is probably exactly the same plastic case. Mm -hmm. And it's like a kind of, for want of a better word, shitty chorus pedal. Yeah. But that shitty chorus pedal doesn't sound like the perfect. Right. Yeah. It has so, a character. I have a I have a really crappy DoD chorus stereo chorus pedal yeah. at home, the Ice Box or whatever, Ice Pick or whatever. Um, <laughs> but it know, just they're, they're great. Sounds they're like, great because it doesn't sound like anything Pearl else. Pearl made a bunch of pedals like the I drum company Pearls, yeah. Pearl in like the '90s or whatever, plastic. But it just doesn't sound like anything else, uh -huh. and it just doesn't sound too perfect. Mm -hmm. um, the tube works. Tube driver. Mm -hmm. I don't know this, but it looks really cool. Made in America, God bless it. Yeah, it's a popular one. You see that, you see that all the time. Ah, I'm on, out on, on, on that pedal one. boards and stuff. Um, a Jacques. I haven't used this. I've been meaning to. I've been meaning to use that well, guy. Well, it looks deceptively small, but it weighs a ton. I'm not sure exactly what that does. I haven't seen anybody pull it out, but um, it's. I think it's just like a, it. For, uh, at least from the name, it sounds like it would just be like super gnarly fuzz. But but blow one, blow two, blow three. I, don't know. I gotta I gotta pull it out and give it a shot. You gotta try it out. Yeah. Great. Next up, uh, phaser flangers. Um, oh, the phaser, the Mutron. Yep. They, we got some good. This is go. a category where we we're doing pretty good. You're doing great. Small, small stone. stone. I love my small stone. Jet phaser. That's a great one. one. Um, this oh. guy. Yeah, just just like an Akai guy. Um, we got a bass micro synth here. Yep. A Fox foot. Foot phaser. Oh, I don't know that. Oh. That guy's cool. Here's a phase five. By Roland. Yeah, there's a great. Here's a Russian small stone down <coughs> here. Wonderful. Um, and then you got another, I believe this is another. Uh, oh, it's a flange. Those, oh, these yeah. are good. Yeah, these yeah, are yeah. really good. I love those. And then what's hiding underneath the mutual? Oh, the electro harmonics. Yeah. Flanger hoax. Mm hmm. 
That's a newer one. Yeah, I haven't pulled this one. This kind of just stays under. They get once you get to the bottom of the drawer, it's kind of hard to work your way back up, you know, because <laughs> everybody uses the Mutrons and everything, and then never... Yeah, we all want we all want this. Yeah. Just look at this thing. Look how beautiful this is. I mean, that's like the quintessential phase pedal. Yeah, and it's a work of art. Although I am a big small stone fan. Small, small stone's good. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they also Ronan used to do one. Called, I think it was called a PH1. It looked like this was in a brown box, which is also fantastic. It just sounds like the 70s. But yeah, this is a. You know, these are great. And I have a Russian reissue one that I love. I think that's what this is. Yeah, mine's green though. Oh, okay. I don't know which one came first. I don't know the order. Um, Modulation. Nice. Um, Qtron by Electro Harmonics. Yeah, those are amazing. Electro Harmonics tube zipper. Uh, regular zipper. That box is cool. Yeah, what is this? I don't know this? if you've ever used that. It I've gives never you used the it. craziest kind of robotic sounding things. Robo talk. Arpeggiator kind of. Uh, oh, it's, random arpeggiator? It's Ooh. weird. I want this. It's, it's weird. It's cool though. Um, oh, the Muga, the Muga yep. Fuga stuff is great. Lopez filter. <coughs> well, obviously, we all know that from the pedals. There's a worm. From the uh, plug in, sorry. There's a oh. worm under there. I've never used that. It's pretty cool. I like the idea of it. One of them. And then uh, good old OC2. Yeah. Useful in many situations. And this is the miscellaneous drawer. Oh, well, um, whammy pedal. Yep, Digitech whammy. Wow. Uh, this is what you will do to if you want to plug a guitar into the our Leslie cab. Oh, nice. So you plug that into there, and then that gives you the preamp. Plus, you've got a rotary sound processor There's here a as well. There's a rotary well. That doesn't really get pulled out that much because of this, but. Right. It's there. It's great. Um, What's the little labs here? Uh, that's oh, just right. one of those uh, drives. You can run it super long distance without as much uh, impedance loss or signal loss. Great. Um, here's a foot switcher for a Line 6 amp, which we do not have. <laughs> <laughs> here's the Line 6. I mean, th these were like life changing though for people. Cause yeah. Because guys in your bedroom, you could suddenly make records. Yeah. In NRG's defense, I've never seen that pulled out, so... <laughs> yeah, but it's great for doing quick yeah. demos. You know, this is... There's not really much here. This is kind of a boring drawer. Nice. Just a couple more over here. Um, reverb and delay. Oh, nice. Yep, an analog delay. Here's the Catlin Bread um, Echo Rec, which is absolutely fantastic. Holy Grail. I love these. I used this mm -hmm. on uh, Don't Let Me Go by the... Uh, the fry, we had this going through a twin into a room with a room mic'd as well. Mm -hmm. And it was the biggest reverb -y sound I've ever had in my life. Echo Theremin. Cool looking pedal. I just like the idea of reverb pedals going into amps. Oh wow, high watt. That's interesting. Echo Theremin. Beautiful. Um. Oh, strings, capos. That's boring. All right, but these are all the things you need it's in necessary the for, yeah. for a studio. Marvelous. Oh, great. Compressors, Keeley 4 knob. Wow, what is this? That's a Dynacomp. That's a, that's a, a Kai, I believe? Yeah. Hexacomp, so it looks like a multiband compressor. Uh -huh. Low to high multiband compression for a guitar that, or a bass. That's freaking awesome. I want to know about that. Yeah, this guy doesn't really get pulled out that much either. Yeah, you because you got a Kiwi and a Dynacomp, you know, so it's kind of like you need time to play with it, but it's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Really, really good idea. And then ah, because why not? Wow, this is great. Talkbox, Ottawa. Great. This guy's cool for doing like um. Yeah, I love this. I think those. the other Kyle told me this trick to like, uh, if you're doing octaves in a chorus, there's like yeah. a, just a filler thing. Yeah. Just stick that on there so it kind of sits back a little bit and isn't so in your face, it's great. That's wonderful. Oh no, he, uh, this guy, it was with this guy. Oh yeah, the q zone, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> cool. Yeah, that's a Dave Jordan, Jordan trick. Made it sit back a little bit. Yep. Yeah, the q zone's amazing. The q zone, for those that don't know, is basically a wild pedal when you do that on the wild pedal, but it's on a rotary knob. Yeah. So you can sit there and choose the specific frequency. Yeah, they have a really unique sound. Yeah, Dave Jordan used to do that. All those Alice in Chains big guitars, mm -hmm. there's Q-Zone in the middle of it, just so it's like, you yeah. know, that, you know, uh, 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 
<coughs> just those huge wall of guitars. Mm. Yeah. All right, marvelous. And then we have like, uh, we got a, um, a vintage Echo Rack. Nice. Uh, Echo Plex. A few tape delays. Great. Yeah, Let's check cool. out C. Yeah. Great, so we're in C. Studio C. And we have an SSL 9000J. Correct. And uh, I'm assuming this is 99% of the time this is a mix room. It is, yeah. But pro I'm sure people do vocal overdubs here occasionally. Yeah, there's, so. a, there's a small booth that you could do vocals or reamp guitars or bass or... Great. I did re record a percussion in here, in there yesterday, so... Yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever works. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would assume this is where Jay mainly mixes? Yep, this is where Jay mainly mixes. This is the only NRG room with 32 and 64 out, uh, just right. for the extra outputs for mixing. So, quick question. Mm -hmm. um, how? I didn't ask you this, I should have asked you this at the beginning. How long has this studio been here? Because I know there was an NRG normally at his, originally at his house, correct? Right. Um, this has been here 25 years. Oh, okay, so... Around there. So did he make the Evanescence record here? I believe so. And this would have always been the mix room? No, um, when he first bought the studio, it was only Studio A. Oh, it was only Studio A, okay. Yeah, and then um, with the money and stuff that came with those records, right. he built B and C. Oh, I see. Not right. sure where he did the Evanescence record. Right. So I'm just intrigued. That. But yeah, when he Jay built out B and C, that's why they're so drastic, drastically different than ah, Studio A. Because he, this was all just like a warehouse storage part of it, Great. part of the building. So nice. This is all, all the all the design in B and C is all Jay's doing. Right. Hence the uh, sort of Moroccan theme yep. and the rest of it, um, which is relaxing. It seems like a place that you could come and work for mm -hmm. many hours. Yep. Um, so this is his main mixing console. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have a four thousand, so I know I know these fairly well. Of course, mm -hmm. a nine thousand. Do you work much on this console? Yeah. So yeah, you know the automation a, pretty... Yeah. Is yeah, this flying well. faders or... or um, it's total recall. A total recall. Total recall. Great. And as far as outboard is concerned... Oh, cool. um, printing back through the library blue? Yep. That's what I do. Yep. Yeah, those sound fantastic. Those are the... Opinions, obviously. These have been around for a long time. But I can name you three or four really amazingly well-known mixers. Mark Ender, for one, prints through one of these. And obviously Jay's printing through one of these. I mean, they, people love them. And uh, even when I was talking to Barry over at Radar, who's really, really obsessed with, with, with getting the best digital results, you know, he, he wasn't so loving towards some of the companies. And I was like, well, what about Lavery? And he's like, well, you know, Lavery make great stuff. So even a major competitor has to admit that Larry made great stuff. So that says a lot. And the guys that run that company are amazing. Um, transient designer. Mm -hmm. Distressors have to have. Um, 1176, um, so 33609. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, the Clairphonic. Yep. Do you like that? Do you use it much? Uh, it's cool, yeah. It, 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 it was on Jay's mix bus for a while, but uh, API 5500 has replaced that, but that guy still gets plugged in. Sounds good. Yeah, Joe Ciccarelli uses one. And when I first, uh, I thought if Joe uses one, I should pro probably try it out. <laughs> and then the Bricasti is a favorite of everybody's these days. It's, you can't, you can't beat that. It doesn't get any better. Wonderful. And then the TC Electronics underneath? Yeah, it's a fireworks guy. Um, we use that a lot for um, uh, guitar delays and stuff. Hmm. Like lead guitars, or you want to add just a little bit of, little bit of sauce to it. And then a 480. Yep. So you're finding increasingly though most people are like using a lot of effects in the box. Yeah. Less outboard stuff, so there's less need for outboard stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're coming to use a console just so they can break it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, a lot of the like the return, like the reverbs and delays and stuff, a lot of people will do in the box. Mm -hmm. um, I can speak for Jay and know that the Bercasti and the 480 are his reverbs. He doesn't right. use any like in the box reverbs, but you know, Echo Boy and oh, uh, so uh, Micro Pitch yeah. from Sound Toys and all that stuff gets used every session. Yeah, I saw that with uh, Spike Stent, Echo Boy, Echo Boy, Echo Boy. All oh, yeah. Place. People love that plugin. I love that plugin. You can do anything with that guy. Yep. It's a great, great plugin. Well, fantastic. And then monitoring Dyn Audios. Are those Jay's uh, um, preferred monitors? They are, yeah. 
Um, again, the C4s as they were in Studio B, and then the BM6s, the passive runs. Oh, those are passive? Yep. What run, are they being run with? Do I think you use a Bryston in here? Bryston? Yeah, Bryston 4B. Fantastic. All the mains are with um, uh, cord amps. Wonderful. Thanks, Kyle. Of course, it was my pleasure. I appreciate it. Um, I'm glad for that last bit of history because I didn't know that he had, but that makes sense. Start with the one studio, expand and build mm -hmm. it. And that makes sense why B and C have got so much more personality. Right. Uh, he, he, he redid A when he bought it because it was Weddington Studios beforehand. Um, and he redid that, but B and C were added on at a later date. I don't remember Weddington. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was like a gospel studio. Oh, okay. Did some gospel stuff or, yeah. Uh, there's some photos around somewhere. It was, it was pretty cool. Beautiful. Total 70s. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks ever so much for showing us around. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. And uh, thank you ever so much for watching and have a marvelous time recording and mixing.